What is the best regenerative brake setting to use on an EV? Do we need to constantly adjust it based on conditions? Now, a recent video I made that included a real world trial that I carried out using those various settings caused a flood of comments telling me I'm wrong. Well, this trial threw up some really surprising results you'll not want to miss. Many of you are getting this totally wrong, so stick around to find out what's going on and what setting you should use. Not all you read or hear is actually true, even AI gets it wrong sometimes. Now, spoiler alert, most recently, the Teslas coming off the production line no longer allow you to alter the setting away from maximum. So let's look into the facts. This is Dave Takes It On, I'm Dave. Well, my channel is called Dave Takes It On, and it was launched to actually try out all these so-called facts and truths to prove whether they are facts and whether they're true. And my trusty Renault 5e was used for this specific trial. For an entire week, when I first got the car, I set the dashboard display to show the efficiency, rated in miles per kilowatt hour, and all the advertised and WLT fig figures stated I should be getting around four miles per kilowatt hour. I never used anything but the lowest, weakest setting for regenerative braking that the car provided. The weather varied by a considerable amount, from relatively warm to below freezing. I drove on urban roads and rural roads. I drove fast and slow. I covered dozens of motorway miles. And all in all, it was a pretty good, comprehensive, totally representative first week of the trial. Then I entered the second half the second week of the trial by selecting maximum regenerative braking. I then continued to use that setting for the entire second week, driving on motorways and a variety of urban and rural roads once more, driving fast, driving slow again with wildly changing weather conditions once again. But the results were insanely conclusive. During the first week, the efficiency readings varied between 2.7 and 3.0 miles per kilowatt hour. Never higher, never lower than these readings. At the start of the second week, once I'd set the regen to maximum, the efficiency meter almost immediately rocketed up to 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour. I filmed it, or rather Jonas alongside me filmed it. It continued to rise for the remainder of that first day, peaking at four miles per kilowatt hour. And for the rest of the second week, never fell below 3.5, nor exceeded four miles per kilowatt hour. Just to remind you, this is raw data. Uh, it's been photographed, it's been videoed, and as stated, it is one of the prime reasons for launching this channel in the first place almost three years ago. Try it out. Yet when I reported this in a video about the Renault 5, I got a stream of comments about, well, it was just plain wrong. And others stating along the lines that, well, I've merely changed my driving style to prove my point or totally misunderstood all about regenerative braking. I'm gonna leave it up to viewers to decide if they believe that any of these are correct. So before we investigate further, let me report my conclusions. Regenerative braking is there to maximize range and efficiency and should be set to maximum at all times. Tesla makes some of the most efficient EVs in the entire world and their latest models have removed the ability to adjust the setting down from the maximum it can do. There's obviously no setting to turn it off altogether. And the website has information about regenerative braking. And it states it is there to increase driving range. Now, quick scientific note, to increase the range of an EV that it can travel without changing anything else can only be achieved by increasing the efficiency of the entire EV. Now, I need to avoid being super nerdy here, so I'm just going to stick to basics and tell you what's happening scientifically, because it's all down to energy. A car uses energy to get up to speed, let's say 70 mile an hour. And that energy in an ice car comes from burning petrol and from using electricity in an EV. Once you're up at 70, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could then just switch your engine off and coast all the way to your destination? You can't. It was Sir Isaac Newton who first reported why in his three laws of motion. 
the first law states that body remains at rest, not relevant here, or in motion at a constant speed in a straight line unless it is acted upon by a force. So, because we cannot maintain that constant 70 mile an hour in our car when we turn the engine off, there must be a force or forces acting against that. And there are two primary forces. The first is the rolling resistance of the car. And this includes, for example, the resistance of the tires on the road and the resistance of moving parts like the rotor uh, inside components like motors. If tires didn't have any friction, they would just spin endlessly when you applied the throttle, as they do on ice, less friction. And there's no such thing as frictionless bearings. Well, the second force we're dealing with is drag, which includes the physical force trying to stop the car moving and also the friction of the air moving over the car. Now, we've all put our hands out of the car window at high speed and felt that blunt force. But the air passing over the body also experiences friction, which also slows the car down. Drag is measured by a simple formula to produce a reading that varies wildly depending on the speed, the density of the air and the shape of the car. But put simply, drag has a value of zero when its car is stationary and that drag increases dramatically as the speed increases. Both rolling resistance and drag try to stop the car from moving. Nature really does love a balance, an equilibrium. And with energy, this is uh, generally called entropy. It's why an ice cube melts or a hot loaf cools down. It's energy dispersal to reach or maintain that equilibrium. Well, there is one more force we need to know about. This is inertia, momentum, or kinetic energies, as it's called technically. Once a car is up to 70 mile an hour, if we do switch the engine off, the car doesn't stop instantly. And that's because we've stored momentum or energy called kinetic energy. If we drove into a wall at this speed, that stored energy would cause massive damage. It would uh, destroy the car, bending steel chassis, bending panels, smashing windows, and doing you, the driver, no good at all. So using all this, let's put it into a theoretical test. We start going at 70 mile an hour, we're on a nice straight level road, no bends, and we're heading towards a stop sign where we're going to be totally legal, law abiding, and we're going to stop. We have regenerative braking set to off on this first run, so we simply lift our foot off the accelerator. We're now coasting, and immediately we'll feel the slight deceleration. We know we're slowing down. If we can time this exactly right, we will coast to a complete standstill at the exact moment we reach the stop sign. In reality, we don't. We might need to apply a little bit more power if we're falling short, but we're much more likely to be going a bit too fast and we need to use the brakes just a touch. By the way, coasting to a halt like this is extremely annoying and dangerous to all the cars behind you who definitely won't be coasting. Now our brakes have friction pads that press against a metal or ceramic disc and we know that friction causes things to heat up. Braking simply turns your momentum, your kinetic energy, from movement into heat energy. You can't create or destroy energy, you can only change its form. So here kinetic energy becomes heat energy. So you come to a halt at the stop sign and your kinetic energy is now zero, you're stationary. All your kinetic energy has turned into drag or heat energy that the brakes are designed to disperse to the atmosphere. All the energy you used to get up to speed and all you used by pressing the brake pedal has gone. You're back to square one. By contrast, let's now set the brake regeneration to the absolute maximum and just repeat the exercise. So here you drive at 70 mile an hour, but you can get much closer to the stop sign before you lift your foot off the accelerator. As Soon as you do, the computer instantly turns your motor into a generator that produces electricity. Once again, nothing is lost. I got one comment that stated that motors using regen lose energy. They don't, you can't lose energy. It can be transformed, you can't lose it. They don't lose energy, they use energy to produce electricity. So your kinetic energy becomes electrical energy stored back in your battery. 
The regen braking brings you to a halt at the stop sign. Your kinetic energy is now back down to zero, but your brakes have not been used. You have almost no kinetic energy turned to heat energy. What has been possible has all gone back into stored electrical energy in your battery from where it started. This is the exact principle of a pure hybrid car, petrol engine hybrid. So we end up stationary once again, but now some or all or a lot of the kinetic energy has now been returned to your battery and we can use this when we set off from the lights and drive a certain distance with it. So this is effectively free energy. It's energy we always used to turn to heat in an ice car because there was nowhere else to send it. We had to turn it into heat and the brakes got rid of it. Now we can store it in the form of electricity in the battery of a hybrid, plug-in hybrid or BEV. Free energy returned to whence it came. But hold on, it's a slight twist. It's not entirely free energy. You see, when you're coasting, you might have to lift off maybe a quarter of a mile away from the stop sign to reach there at a zero speed. While with regen, we have to keep driving a bit more and therefore keep using energy until we get quite close, maybe 100 yards or 100 metres away. That takes some energy and that's in the form of electricity taken out of the battery. However, here we have to thank the designers of EVs and hybrids because they all show us gauges or meters displaying how much energy you're using at any time. That gauge or meter shows us that the energy required to hold us at a constant 70 mile an hour for that extra 10, 20 or 30 seconds is absolutely trivial compared to the vast quantity of kinetic energy stored in a two ton vehicle traveling at 70 mile an hour. That is huge. So not entirely free, but it's a massive amount of energy returned to your battery that will be used to set off again from the stop sign when it's all clear. And that will be virtually energy free motoring until it runs out. It is, as Tesla states, a device to extend your range. You've used that energy instead of what's stored left in your battery. So why put it there? Why put the switch there, the ability to change or switch uh, regen on or off or vary the, the strength of it? No, it's not for use on motorways or in icy conditions, as many suggested. All EVs have traction control, all of them. They have to, otherwise that instant torque would wildly spin your wheels, shredding your tyres in no time if they didn't have. The traction control and the brake regen are integrated systems on your EV. They don't fight each other, they talk to each other. And traction control normally cannot ever be turned off either. No, it doesn't make any sense at all to waste all that free energy and lose extra range. But the manufacturers tell you the real reason, you just haven't read the adverts deeply enough. It is to make you feel more comfortable and help you to adjust to EV driving by giving you the option of allowing you to lift off and coast just like you always used to do, like you've done for the last few years or few decades. Exactly the same reason why you'll usually get an option in most EVs to either bring you to a complete stop or to allow your vehicles to creep forward instead of stopping. That is what drivers of automatic ICE cars have had to put up with forever. They can't stop it. Automatics creep, it's the way they work. Regenerative braking is designed to be so familiar to you with the settings, you can hardly notice you're driving electric. Exactly the same reason Porsche is giving you a gearbox and BMW gives you artificial engine sounds, for goodness sake. Those are purely to make you feel happier. Now, before anyone comments about Porsche gearbox offering you better acceleration, huh, make a list of all the other EVs in the world that include a multi-speed gearbox. Or alternatively, a list of all the EVs with a single gear that are very much faster than a Porsche. Rivian, Tesla, anyone? Of course, I could always be wrong. My data are precise, they're exact, but my video is what I've concluded from that data. Any takers? I'm Dave, thanks very much for watching. If you have enjoyed this, please click the like button. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe.